who I am. I'll skip past that one. Just in case anybody doesn't, that's my Twitter handle, my blog post, and you will find me in the bar later. So the important thing about writing content is to consider where the people are actually going to read that content. And the reality is, is that today, 50% of the time, people are reading their, your content on their phones. Another 50% of the time, they're reading it on their laptop. And 50% on their tablets. So I make up statistics 150% of the time. So don't really start to believe the statistics. But the point is the same. People are reading content everywhere. Yeah, we cannot predict where they're going to read it. We can design a website that's going to look different on different screens and different resolutions. But most of the time, we are displaying the same content, the same words that people read. So we have to address that when we're trying to write it. The interesting thing for me is why people are reading what I write. What is it that makes it? One of the things that hopefully is what makes people want to read what I write or other people's stuff is that that person has a reputation. They want to read your stuff because you're the expert, so you've got to prove that you're the expert. You've also got to try and be interesting. You know, when you were at school, you were forced to read boring stuff. We're all adults now. No one's forcing us to read it, so we've got a choice of reading stuff. We're not going to read it if it's boring. And I like to hope that sometimes it's entertaining. Yeah, it's not just ent interesting. You're, not, that you're going to feel at the end of the time that you've read it that that was not a waste of your life. There's, that it, there's the expression, that's 15 minutes of my life, I'm never going to get back again. I hope that if you ever read anything that I write, you're not going to think that. Because I don't want to waste your time. You also want to, if I'm going to say something about how you, whatever the topic is, I need to show you that I'm the expert. Because otherwise, it's just some guy taking his five minutes of fame on the internet and just waffling. To be the expert, it's important that you're accurate. If you write a thousand word post and you make one factual mistake and the reader spots that, they immediately devalue all of your content. Yeah, it's all gone. They don't care anymore. You're not the expert. You're not the authority. You made a mistake. Clearly, that person writing that is just making it up. They don't really know what they're talking about. And so you've got to make sure that you're accurate. It's also helpful if, you, if it's useful. You know, There's a lot of blog posts and articles out there that have really good titles, and I'll come back to a good title later, that when you get to actually read the content, you realize that said nothing. Yeah, I'm only going to read that once. So again, it's all about don't wasting your reader's time. So headlines. A headline is a promise. Now, we're all from different countries here, so it's a little bit difficult for me to, uh, to guess this, but I'm from the UK, so I can only talk about it in the UK. In a newspaper in Britain, we have the traditional newspapers, that the, the in-depth ones, or claim to be called the Times, the Telegraph, the Independent. In the, in the US, it'll be the Washington Post and the New York Times, and I'm sure there's something high level in Germany as well. Those are big, typically they used to be what was called broadsheets, the big format newspapers, and they would have a headline that matches the content. And then what we have, in England, we call them the red tops, the tabloid papers, the smaller ones, the scandal sheets. Yeah? They've become more scandalous over time, but they did at least used to pretend to tell the news. They have a different person who to write the headline to the content. Quite often, the headline is there to grab you in, but it's actually written by somebody else that wrote the content. So they might, they might not match. So today's world on Facebook, how many times do you see posts that say you won't believe what happened next? Well, when you click on those, I bet you anything, most of the time you do believe what happens next. It might still be interesting and funny, but you did believe it. You knew what was going to happen before you clicked. So we've got to be very careful with our headlines that they don't become clickbait. Because we want, we want to write them so that people will come and read them. But at the same time, we want to make sure that when they have clicked, they're reading what they expected to read. And I'll come to some examples of that later. Again, it's about don't disappointing them. Don't, make, don't waste their time. 
if you saw a sign that said free money and you get there and it's not free money, you're disappointed. Don't disappoint them. In England, we have a great one. The ATM machines, or cash machines as we call them, quite a lot of them have a big sign above them that says free money. I put my card in. I never get free money. What it means is I'm not being charged for them to give me my own money. Thank you very much. But the sign says free money. So that's clickbait. That's disappointing me. So don't waste my time. And so it's about you can trick me once. And if you trick me once to click on your link, that's my fault. But if you try to trick me again, that's your fault. So don't do it. So what about how people read? So we did the why, now the how. This is a blog post that I wrote. I've zoomed out so you can see it. It's still online. It's still formatted exactly the same way. I haven't changed it. It's too long. And people didn't read it. And we know that people didn't read it because look at the number of comments. Zero. There was quite a lot of hits on this article. It was quite a popular thing. It's the transcript of my thing about ten, the next 10 years for Joomla. So it was quite popular, but people didn't read it. Not a single comment. It's got the lowest page reading time on Google Analytics of anything on my blog. So if you know on Google Analytics, you can see how long someone's been on the page. Obviously, that's an average, unless you're using the live thing. I think the average for this page was 32 seconds. I think the reading time for this page probably is about seven to eight minutes. So if the average time is 32 seconds, that's a lot of people click goodbye. <laughs> Most of the time, it's people going, I'm going to read that later. I don't have the time to do that. Who has bookmarks in their browser and actually ever looks to see what those bookmarks are? Yeah, You've got hundreds and hundreds of bookmarks for stuff that you went... That's going to be interesting. I'm going to read that later when I've got some time, when I've got, when I've got a coffee or, or something, or maybe on my next uh, flight or train trip, trip. You never do. You've bookmarked it. You've forgotten about it. There's always exceptions, Frank. And, <laughs> and Frank, you are one of the world's exceptions. <laughs> the thing about when it's too long is people just don't read it. There are some tricks you can do um, and I, when you've still got big content, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But all, the other thing that stops people reading it, and some people's blogs are really, really, really bad for that. If it's too wide, you can't read it. Chris mentioned in his keynote this morning about browsers having a reader button that hides all the rest. The other thing they do is they set a, a predefined width to the number of characters per line. I think it's 135 characters per line. About I can be, I'll get saying think because I don't remember exactly, and I did say be accurate. The point is, if it's too long, what happens is your eye gets to the end, and when it, normally we just jump back, you can't see where you started from again. So how many, if it's too long, what happens is you end up reading the same line over and over again, or you miss a line, stuff like that. So you've got to be careful about making it too wide. It's also really difficult when it's when it's like when it's too wide to scan to speed read, yeah, to see the key points. They just they don't jump out at your page of the page, and it, apparently studies have shown it's very difficult for you to concentrate when you're reading it if you have to constantly be actually moving your head across, almost like those typewriters that used to come along and you get to the end of your ping. Yeah, it's really difficult to do that. Again, too much like hard work. There's a couple of people in the Joomla world who write blog posts occasionally. And one of the reasons I think that they write them occasionally is not many people actually read them, and they're quite disappointed with how many people read or comment. And if you look at their template, you can see why. They've gone for a really clean look. Great. No distracting modules and stuff on the, on the, along the side. But then they've now gone full width, responsive full width on a 20-inch screen. You know, you've got the whole you've got the whole blog post on one line. You know, you know, you have to resize your browser just to even have an attempt to read it. So there's nothing wrong with white space down the left and right. Just because you don't want to put a module and some fancy graphics in there, some nice space down the side would be very nice. Thank you. There's a reading reason why Medium.com doesn't let you go full width because you can't read it. Yeah. So don't make it too wide. 
And don't make it too dense. That's another that I've zoomed in again on that same article. That is just heavy going. It just looks boring. Yeah? If not, it's really interesting. You know, I wrote it. It must be really interesting. And I'm the expert and the authority on it, so it's worth your while to read it. But clearly, nobody did. Because it looks like an essay that you might have written at college yeah, or, or university or school. It's just boring. It's really hard work reading it. Yeah, you're reading it and going, God, goodness sake, Brian, will you get to the point? What is it you're trying to say? It's too much hard work, and people just didn't read it. And one of the reasons is studies have shown and, um, that we read in what's called an F pattern. This is a, a, a heat map that I just downloaded from, from uh, Google, did a quick search, F pattern. This was the first one that matched, uh, but there are plenty of them. Um, and you can see... People are read it, skimming reading the article. They're not, it's not solid. If people were reading every single word going all the way across with an equal intensity, that page would be bright red. It wouldn't have gaps and stuff. So it proves that we actually don't read in a consistent pattern. Um, this person, Fran Leibovitz, who I don't know who it is, but I got them off one of those simplyquotes.com that give you nice quotes, says, think before you speak and read before you think. So when I'm writing a post, how do I do it? Well, I don't actually write my blog posts in Joomla. I also don't write them in Word. I write them in the simplest text editor that I can find so that I have zero distractions. It's completely full screen, nothing, nothing else, so I can concentrate on the words. Words come first, formatting comes later. Yeah. Just plain text, really simple, because if I'm concentrating on the words, I'm making sure that they're clear, they're concise, and you're not going to misunderstand them. Um, for those of you in the room who are not English native speakers, who might actually write stuff in English, for quite people in the, few people in the Joomla community, they'll send me a post and say, Brian, could you correct my English? Yeah, on, on this, I really want to get it right. Can you correct my, my English? And I'll happily do that for anybody. Not, not a problem. I don't rewrite it in perfect English. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is reading it and removing any bits that are, could lead to confusion and misunderstanding. Because you know that that person's German or Polish or Russian. You know that when you're reading it and that they're writing in English. So you give them a little bit of forgiveness. Maybe that their spelling isn't perfect or structure might be a bit strange. But what you can't, if you misunderstand something because of their bad knowledge, you're lost. So I, I do that quite a bit. And even if you are a native English speaker, concentrate on your words to make sure you don't have that misunderstanding. And shorter is always better. Uh, those of us who are vertically challenged will always tell you that. Um, as I showed you in that big, long post, it is much, much easier to read something that is shorter than something that is longer. I mean, that's just common sense. And it's quicker, clearly. But as a writer, it forces you to be precise. My brother-in-law is not native English speaking, but he speaks far better English than I do. His grammar is absolutely perfect. The structure, adverb, adjective, all pronoun. Everything. It's perfect. But he says something in a hundred words that I'd say in 20. Because the grammar and structure is so perfect. You need to be sure. You need to make it quick to read. So you have to be much more precise in what you write. Again, the less words you have, the less chance that someone's going to misunderstand what it was that you were talking about. Um, if I write a post and I've got one point that I really want to stress. Write the point. Don't write a whole paragraph to explain the point first, because that explanation might start to confuse people. By the time they get to the bit that you thought was the point that you were saying, they've completely misunderstood you and think you're talking about something completely opposite. Grammar is a funny thing. Different languages have different rules about grammar. Some of them are very strict, and some of them are not so strict. Sometimes, culturally, you reinvent grammar. America, looking at the Americans in the room, you know, they invented grammar, reinvented grammar and spelling and everything. But 
when I, if I was to write something in a book, my grammar is going to be correct. It's going to be absolutely perfect. But I want to write short sentences. I can't write short sentences and observe all the rules of grammar. So chuck it out the window. One idea per paragraph. That's actually quite a small amount. No, I said write your concise ideas without big examples. I only put one per paragraph. That means you can have a lot of paragraphs. That's good. Yeah? The rules of grammar say you should expand on your point and be more informative. Don't. The rules of grammar say bullet points are bad because bullet points, you're not using the grammar. It's not. Bullet points are good on the web. They're quicker to read. They're shorter to read. They're more concise. Therefore, they are more accurate and there's no misunderstanding. And it's all about, comes towards one thing, which is simplicity. You can reduce the word count of what you write. It's going to make it automatically simpler to read. There's a couple of tricks you can do. It does take a while to get into the habit of writing short and concise. Steve Birkin, in his book, Don't Make Me Think, suggests that what you should do is write your post, press save, Go and have a coffee or a cigarette or a cup of tea or whatever it is you like to do. Come back and ruthlessly edit it by 50%. And press save. And then go away and speak to your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever. Have another break. And then come back and do it again. And only then will you have got the right number of words. Because if it still makes sense at that point, when you've edited that brutally, then you've solved everything. People can read it quickly and easily, and they're not going to misunderstand you. A mistake I made in that big blog post, and you will see it, it's still there, the mistake is still there, is it has an introduction. And the introduction says something along the lines of, this, this post is the uh, text of a speech that I gave at the Joomla World Conference in Cancun on October, November the 8th, 2014. That is completely meaningless to the rest of the article. But I just wasted three minutes of your time to read it. <coughs> if you need to put something like that, put it at the bottom. You know, after people have read the important stuff. Yeah? We don't need big introductions. It all goes towards reducing that complexity and increasing the readability. Which, of course, at the end, as I keep saying, gets rid of the misunderstandings. So... This is the first of um, some tips. There's an app. <coughs> it's actually a website as well as an app. I just tweeted it. You just tweeted it? Oh! <laughs> you know, in reference to my talk or just in general? Uh, just in general. Oh, okay. That's, that's pretty good. Okay. Um, the app's called Hemingway App. Um, it's, it's pretty cheap. Uh, it's both a website and a, an app for an iPhone, I think. Um, it's a very, very simple text editor. Yeah, you can see at the top, you can do bold, italic, and bullet points and indents. That's about it. But what it really does is, as you can see, it highlights things. It, first of all, on, on the right, you can see it gives you a readability level and a grade level. Uh, of course, it's, it's American, so that's what level, grade of school it is. I have no idea what grade level six is. Yeah. For all I know, that could be university education. Yeah, Crystal's looking at me. What is it, three-year-olds? <laughs> Okay, so it's British level four then. Age oh, four. British age four. This is the readability level that's by the law. Oh. Oh, okay. Thanks for the correction. There's also, it also looks at your sentences. So this, this yellow one, it says it's too hard to read. Uh, this red one, it says it's very hard to read. Um, this one, it's like highlighting the word utilize on the third sentence. You can utilize a shorter word. Apart from the fact that that's clearly a spelling mistake, because there is no such word spelling with I Z E. Yeah. yeah, that does not exist in the English language. Um, but it's suggesting that you could use a different word instead. And this also talks about active voice and passive voice. I've never really quite got the handle over which I prefer on that. So it just can be useful to at least make sure that you write in one voice and don't keep switching between them. Um, I'm not necessarily suggesting that an app like Hemingway is what you use to write everything forever from now on, but it's definitely useful as an exercise to go through to start writing stuff to, for it to highlight what you're doing and gradually 
you'll start to recognize the things it's suggesting and not write that yourself. Um, the second tip, oh, before we do this, have you tweeted this next tip yet? Spoilers. There is a rule in writing that you should, and also giving presentations, that you should start the presentation or the article by telling them what you're going to tell them at the beginning. Then at the end, you tell them what you said you were going to tell them. And you summarize what you told them. People aren't stupid. It's a three-minute article. You don't need to give them an introduction, then the article, then a conclusion, then a summary of what you just did. You're just repeating yourself. You've made the article twice as long without actually saying anything new. And nobody likes spoilers. So there's one of the things today is how do you discover your articles? You know, by newsreaders and things like you, Quite a lot of the time it's by newsreaders or Zeit or Flipboard or stuff like that, and they're pick, picking out the first paragraph. But if your first paragraph is a complete summary of your article and there's nothing more, well, there's no point in reading the article. So no one's going to click to read it. If your first part was also that introduction about this was recorded in blah, 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 no one's going to be interested in it. So again, they're not going to read it. Chopin, who is a musician, said simplicity is the final achievement. You know, at the end of the day, we want everything. The simpler you can make it, the better it will be. So I talked about writing the text and that I use just a regular plain text editor. But you need to format the text at the end of the day as well. You want it to actually look nice and attractive as well as, well as the content. And white space is good. Not just white space left and right, but white space between the lines, and therefore having shorter paragraphs so you have less, more white space, more lines. It makes the text read, oh, as it says, it makes the text breathe. It makes it visually less daunting. You remember back to that screenshot of that long blog post. When you open it that first time, it just looks scary. This is going to be hard work to read this. Put a lot of white lines in, it's going to be better. It's easier to speed read, and to scan, and to find the bits you're interested in. And I'm just going to show you an example. Oh, maybe, maybe in a bit. Um, it, all of this stuff is not hard. You're going to go away and say, most of you are going to say, you know, Brian didn't actually tell me anything new in that session. I knew all that stuff before. You just don't do it. Yeah. It's not hard. You just have to make the effort to do it. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. You won't have to be writing content, going for a coffee, writing content. So if you'll just write it and you'll write it simple and clean. But what's really important is it's, you get easy benefits. You can see the results easily. If I rewrote that article, again, shorter, with some of the other stuff I'm talking about, the reading time will go up and we're more on Google and will more closely match the realistic reading time. So I know that the majority of people are reading what I wrote. If it's a sales pitch <coughs> that you're writing, it's the same thing. If no one's actually reading your sales pitch, you've just wasted your time. How many of you write uh, long document proposals to clients. You know, it's the same thing. If that's really long and boring, the client doesn't read it properly. They misunderstand you. They get bored with it. They don't. Even, they chuck it out of the bit in the bin if they're comparing you with somebody else. You know, that, I don't want to work with this guy who's going to give me a thousand word answer to a one line question. We want to keep it simple. So let's try it. This is. It's a slightly different article, but the same thing. It's very in depth text. Just a simple heading. It's too dense. So what I'm going to do is add some white space. So you can see what I've done. I use block quotes quite a bit because it's my style of writing, but it's immediately given a lot of space. And I've put more headings in. I just go back so you can see it again. That was what it was before. And now. Now, it's, by putting those headings in, it's done something else. As well as highlighting the points, it makes it easy to scan. Now, you should, I don't know if you can read that summary of how to write a presentation, you can see the entire article just by reading those headlines. So now you know, I need to know about 
the 100 word description bit so you can focus on the bit that you want. So you can still have the huge amount of text because you've got a lot of things to say. But by using the headlines, the white space and breaking it up, it's really much easier for people to read. I'll leave you to think about that one. If it takes you a lot of words to say what you have in your mind, you need to give it more thought so that you can say it in less words. So, I mentioned about headlines. Okay. Headlines should be concise and informative. They should be short, rich in information, and have meaning without being the full content. What do I mean without being the full content? If you're a sports journalist and the headline is Inter Milan beat Real Madrid 6-0 in a six-goal thriller with this person got sent off and this one scored a hat-trick. There's no point reading the rest. We've got busy lives. The headline was enough, so nobody's going to click through to read it. And that's really important. And as I said before, you must be honest about your... Head, your you've got to be honest about your content, but be honest about the headline, because especially if the headline is what someone's going to see in a newsreader, that's going to, or on Facebook link or something that's going to pull them to your site, you don't want them to feel that they've been tricked into going to their site, into your site. Because I promise you this, you can trick you, you can trick me once to visit your sites. The chances of you tricking me another time pretty min, pretty minimal. So being honest, what's my worst headline that I've written on my blog? It's this one, and I haven't corrected these, so you can still go and. Check them. My worst headline is top 10 Joomla extensions. So why is it my top worst headline? Because it's misleading. It's dishonest. And it was clickbait. Because what would you expect if you see Brian Tiemann's top 10 Joomla extensions? Cliff? Yeah, spe yeah, specific extensions. What did I write? What I wrote was... The top 10 Joomla extensions to me have the following features. They're upgradable, they do this, they do this, they do this. Those were my things. I didn't think at the time I was doing anything wrong by writing top 10 Joomla extensions. I would say, what I was, in my head, what I was saying is, these are the features that make something a top extension. I think the content on its own is still valid. But if you go to the site and you look for that um, blog post and look in the comments, Nobody really comments that, well, yeah, but upgrade's nice, but I would have put this one at number one. No, what everybody writes was, I feel that you've ripped me off, you've conned me to go to this because I was expecting to see a list of extensions. So I got away with it once. Would I get away with it a second time? I don't know. So I've learned that lesson. So what's my best headline? Um, my best headline this year has been Joomla 3.4 Hidden SEO Secret Revealed. Um, again, if you go to the post, it's really not that amazing, but it's definitely a secret and it's definitely about SEO and people didn't know about it and I do tell you what it is. So it's truthful. It's honest. And you will go, I didn't know that and I'm glad that I know about it now. So that was a good part of it. Everybody likes a secret. Yeah, we all like gossip, we all like secrets, we all want to know something that we didn't know before that maybe other people don't know. And it, most importantly, when you read the content, it, the headline was clear and accurate description. You weren't conned, you weren't fooled. And where it really scored was how this article was shared on social media. The tweets, and the, this article of mine, I think, has had more tweets and Facebook shares than any other in the last two years. And as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot better articles than this one and more interesting and more valuable. But in terms of it being shared, people did because of the title. Because you knew, And people clicked through on those shares because they, it sounded like something worth or interesting. And when they did, it was. No, it wasn't a, you won't believe what happens next and you would believe it. This was something you didn't know. So a tip. Um, this is a site that I came across. Um, I'll leave it on, up on the screen for a little bit if anyone wants to.
write it down. Um, it's not a serious site, yeah, or it's not a serious tool. It's supposed to generate titles for you. I wouldn't suggest you use it to actually generate your titles, but use it to see the sort of stuff that it will do and the explanations it will give. I'm, I'm going to move on, and then if, if necessary, you can get it afterwards. This is what it looks like. And what you do is you start off by entering your subject. So I'm going to enter the word planning. And it comes up with what the world would be like if planning didn't exist. And what's really interesting for me is that it explains why the, the choice of words are there. So you're actually learning about the process of writing the headline. If I do it again, I get the best ways to utilize planning. And it says... The best is always much better than the second best. People love to be told how to do things and use things. So, and what's the other one? The planning article of your dreams. Um, probably not one to use. And what everyone is saying about planning. Um, that's, an, that's a title I would never use personally. Because if everyone is saying it, chances are I've already read it. Yeah? But this is just a... an. Something with nice spelling mistakes, I can see. They're spelled resources without an R. Um, but it's a, it's a tool that you can use just to see what titles could be, to give you something, some imagination to think about it. Um, Copyblogger.com says, on average, 8 out of 10 people will read headlines, and only 2 out of the 10 will read the rest. That's because your headlines suck. You've not sold me on it. So you need to think about that. And then the final two points of the social media side of it, promoting your content. You have to make it so that you can tell the world. The great headline is the start, but it's only the start of sharing your content and make, getting it around. It goes together. The headline has to be as good as the content. The content and the text all has to be good together. And you have to make it easy to share. There was a blog post about how to write the introduction of your presentation. I read it online a few days ago, and it was brilliant. Really, really brilliant. I wanted to share it. There was no tweet this, no share it, no Facebook link on the page at all. Is it too hard for me to create my own? Of course not. I can just copy paste the link into Twitter that's already open and write it. Did I? No. Because I couldn't be bothered. You know, why, one click, I would have shared it. You know, ten clicks, I'm not going to bother. You've got to make it easy to share. So don't forget putting those sharing tools on. Um, I've put on there Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Google+, Plus if it's still going to be around for a bit longer. The important thing is you have the link places that you should put are the ones that people, your readership, are actually going to use. So the Share This um, widget has about 200 different social media things that you could enable. Um, don't. Enable the ones that people are going to use. You know, if there is, if you're... If there's a particular platform for social media that's really popular in your community or in your industry or your city or country, make sure that one's there. But otherwise, get rid of it. No one is impressed that you've got 200 different places I can share it with. Because when they want to share it, they can't find the one that they were looking for in all those little icons. So that's really important that you have to be able to make it shareable. And I can't stress enough about how the title and possibly the first sentence make it more shareable. Those are the things that Facebook pick up in the previews. They're the things that Twitter cards pick up. They're the things that newsreaders pick up, which means that Flipboard, Zite, Get Prismatic, they're all showing it in the summaries. When you're presented every day with hundreds and hundreds of articles that might be of interest to you, you make selective choices based on the information you can see. That's the title and maybe the first bit of content. That's what makes it readable. That you've enticed someone in, and when you have, you haven't conned them. They don't. They feel happy to have read what you've told them to read. They don't feel, ugh, I've just wasted my time. 
because there are sites that I get tricked to to fo I click on a link in in a Facebook thing or tweet or something. And when I click on it, I can see the which specific site it is that's loading up. I don't even bother reading the article. I just close it again because they've wasted my time before. I'm not going to waste my time again. And uh, finally, um, every presentation should have a cute kitten. So those are my cute kittens. And at this point, I'm going to um, just recommend three places for further reading. Um, the first one is uh, Jacob Nielsen of the Nielsen Group. They've um, been around a long time. They charge a fortune for training, for academic ch training, for writing and SEO and all that sort of stuff. It's a lot of money. Could never afford it. But they also happen to write blog posts and very in-depth articles about everything that they train people on. And that's all free. So you don't get the dynamism, or hopeful of, hopefully, of the speaker, but you do get all the contents. Um, so that's really good. Um, its index is a bit weird. It tends to be by date rather than by subject, so you end up jumping around a bit. But persevere, it is worth it. Uh, Steve Krug, as I mentioned, wrote um, the book Don't Make Me Think. Um, that's the link to the book. It is excellent. It's a very, if you've not read it before, I strongly recommend it. If you're worried about reading a book in English, and English isn't your first language. I don't know if it's been translated. It has. It's, great. It's really simple English. That's why. It's a lot of pictures. Yeah. Uh, there is a second book, um, which is more about testing and stuff. It's not as, I can't remember its title now. It's not as good. Thank you. Rocket Surgery Made Easy. Uh, but Don't Make Me Think is, is a definite recommend. Rocket Surgery Made Easy, possibly less so. And the, but the highlight of this one, these links, is the BBC. Um, they have a uh, BBC Academy, which is um, where they train all their staff, and all their material is on there, and it's really well presented. And if you go to the journalism course, you'll find all about how to write great contents. Um, if you carry on looking at the BBC course, you'll also find out how to do accessibility and lots of other things, because everything they do. Pretty much everything they do is online because I've paid for it, so you can see it. Um, definitely worth reading. 